Data structures have always been some of my favorite things in computer science. There is something really satisfying about turning a slow program into a fast one just by changing how you store your data. But there is one data structure I always found both fascinating and intimidating at the same time. When I learned about Fibonacci heaps, the first thing I thought was, how can anybody come up with that? A few seemingly unrelated ideas thrown together and suddenly you get a really efficient data structure. While Fibonacci heaps are certainly not the prettiest or most elegant data structure, they sure involve some really smart ideas that are worth to be appreciated. Which is why in this video we will create Fibonacci heaps from scratch. Step by step we will look at all the key ideas necessary to invent an extremely clever data structure. And yes, we will also learn what on earth they have to do with Fibonacci numbers. What is the problem Fibonacci heaps try to solve? Let's say we are a network router and we need to handle thousands of messages per second. Some messages might be more important than others and need to be handled more quickly. So we give any incoming message a number based on its priority, called a key. Important messages get a small key like 1 and less important messages a larger key. We always send the message with the smallest key, meaning the highest priority first. A structure like this, where we only care about the smallest value at any point, is called a priority queue. Priority queues are really useful. They are used for example in Dijkstra's algorithm for finding shortest paths. By far the most common implementation of a priority queue is the binary heap. A binary heap is a binary tree where each node stores exactly one element with its key. Because it's a binary tree, every node has up to two children. But there are a few additional properties. First, every level stores as many values as possible, except for possibly the last one, which is filled from left to right. This way, we never use more tree levels than necessary. If we double the number of values in the heap, we only need one more level. This means the number of levels increases logarithmically. The second property is the so-called heap property. Every value is at least as small as its children. Therefore, the smallest value is always the root. This allows us to easily access the minimum element, which is exactly what we want from a priority queue. How do we insert a new element into the heap when a new message arrives? There is only one valid position that doesn't violate property 1. But we still violate property 2, because the new element is smaller than its parent. We can fix this by bubbling up the new element until property 2 is restored. What happens when we want to send the most important message? We'll call this operation extract min. Simply removing the minimum leaves a gap, and there is no easy way to close it without violating our two properties. We instead swap the root with the rightmost element of the last level. This allows us to delete the element while maintaining property 1. We can fix property 2 by repeatedly swapping the new root with the smaller one of its children until it fits. One thing we might want to do is to change priorities of our elements. Maybe when a message hasn't been sent for a while, we want to give it a smaller key and therefore a higher priority. This operation is called decrease key. We can apply the same bubble up approach we use for inserting an element. Granted, to decrease a key, we first need to find it in the tree. But this is not too hard to do. You can imagine maintaining a hash table in which for every value we keep a pointer to its position in the tree. Decrease key turns out to be an essential part of many algorithms which use priority queues. We now know the four basic operations of priority queues. Accessing the minimum value can easily be done in constant time we simply return the value of the root node. For the other operations, we might need to move one node through multiple tree levels, top to bottom for extract min, and bottom to top for insert and decrease key. In the worst case, we need to walk through every level, but we know that the number of levels only grows logarithmically, so the running times are logarithmic in the size of the heap. Logarithmic running time is pretty good. It's the running time we also have for something like binary search. But can we do any better? Let's imagine implementing the simplest, laziest priority queue possible. First of all, a priority queue is just a collection of values. We definitely want direct access to the smallest element. This allows us to implement get min in constant time. To insert an element, we just add it to our collection. We then check if the new element is smaller than the current minimum and update it if necessary. And that's it. In theory, there is nothing stopping us from implementing insert in constant time as well. What about decrease key? As long as we get access to the element by using something like a hash table, we can just decrease its key in place. Then again, we only need to check if we have a new smallest element. This also seems doable in constant time. 
things only start to get tricky when implementing extract min. The problem is not deleting an element, but finding the new smallest element quickly. Because remember, we want to get min to have constant time. To do this, our collection needs to have a certain structure that allows us to find the smallest element quickly. A binary heap has such a structure. The problem is, with a binary heap, we need to restore its two properties after every single operation, even insert and decrease key. So to improve the running times, we want a structure that is less strict and that allows us to be lazy, doing as little work as possible and only when necessary, especially during insert and decrease key. But it should still be strict enough so we can find the smallest element quickly. The Fibonacci heap is exactly the kind of data structure with these properties. As the name suggests, it's based on the binary heap, but it has a much looser structure. The first thing we get rid of is property 1. We now allow trees of any shape. And they don't even have to be binary trees. Every node can have as many children as it wants. And why stop there? We even allow the heap to contain multiple trees. We store the trees in a doubly linked list which we call the root list. The children of every node will also be stored in a linked list. This allows us to quickly add and remove nodes. Additional references which point up and down in each tree allow us to easily access every value in the heap. The one thing from our binary heap we'll keep is the heap property. Inside every tree, values will only grow bigger the deeper we go into the tree. This means the smallest element of the heap is always one of the roots. We'll keep a pointer to it to quickly access it. Let's imagine we remove the smallest element. Which element is the next smallest one? Because each tree satisfies the heap property, we know it must either be one of the root nodes or one of the children of the previously smallest element. So for each extract min call, we will need to iterate over all these nodes to find the next minimum. This means we want to keep both the number of trees in the root list and the number of children per node relatively low. Keep this in mind for later. You might still be wondering what this has to do with Fibonacci numbers. Don't worry, we'll get to that. But let's first start implementing some actual Fibonacci heap operations. Implementing get min is trivial, since we store a reference to the minimum element. But what about insert? Remember, we want to be lazy. What is the simplest thing we can do to add a new element? That's right, we just add a new tree consisting of a single node to our root list, and we update the minimum if the new element is smaller. Great, we just implemented insert in constant time. But you might already spot a problem. Remember, we want to keep the number of trees low, but adding a new tree for every element basically does the opposite. After adding a lot of elements, the next extract min call will need to check all of these nodes, because they're all potential candidates for the next minimum. But here comes the first clever idea of Fibonacci heaps. If the next extract min call after a lot of inserts is slow, why not use that extra time to do some cleanup? We need to iterate over the entire root list anyway to find the next minimum, so while doing that, let's merge single nodes and small trees to form bigger trees. This reduces the number of trees in the root list significantly, and makes subsequent extract min calls a lot faster. Let's see how this be lazy and clean up the mess afterwards approach might look like in practice. Let's assume every insert call takes one unit of time and adds one node to our root list. As we've seen, every extract min call takes at least time proportional to the number of roots, plus maybe some extra time, say 10 units. But during that time, it will clean up the root list significantly, reducing the number of trees to let's say 5. This is what a typical sequence of priority queue operations might look like. A lot of inserts, a couple of extract mins and so on. When we look at how much time every operation needs, we see that after a lot of inserts, the next extract min will be slow because it needs to check every root that was previously inserted. But thanks to our cleanup, most calls are actually quite fast. Here's another way to look at it. What if we don't consider single operations, but the entire sequence as a whole? The first 100 inserts are directly responsible for the extra time of the next extract min. Maybe we shouldn't attribute that extra time to the extract min, but rather to the inserts, evenly distributing it among them. You can think of every insert paying in advance for the additional but constant work it will cost during the next extract min. The same of course also goes for the other inserts. Keep in mind that we're not actually changing anything about what each operation does. We're just looking at the entire sequence of operations redistributing the total work. This kind of perspective shift is called amortized analysis, and it is key for understanding Fibonacci heaps. 
Now, a single extract min never takes more than 15 time units, no matter how many elements were previously inserted. Sure, we need a bit more work per insert, but the total time for each insert remains constant. Of course, the numbers 5 and 10 are only stand-ins for the maximum number of trees after each extract min, and the extra work per extract min on top of iterating over all roots. This is the actual time needed per extract min if we account for amortization. Let's see how we can implement extract min while keeping both these terms as low as possible. First, we need to delete the minimum node, but if we did that, we would be left with some orphan child nodes. So let's first remove them one by one from the child list of the minimum node and insert them into the root list. This already requires some work, depending on how many children the minimum has. Remember when I said that we not only want to keep the number of trees low, but also the number of children per node. We start to see how this becomes important. From now on, let's call the number of children of a node its degree. In this example, all degrees are quite low. But we don't know yet how large node degrees might become as our heap grows. For now, let's assume there is some maximum degree, which gives us an upper bound for the work required in this phase. After removing the minimum node, we will start the cleanup phase. Here, we reduce the number of trees by merging them. To merge two trees, we attach the one with the larger key to the one with the smaller key. We can't do it the other way around, because only this way we preserve the heap property. Also notice that the degree of the red tree increases by one, because we've added one child. But which trees do we merge? Remember, we want to keep node degrees as well as the total number of trees low. Let's just assume for now that node degrees will in fact be low. Can you think of a merging scheme that guarantees that the number of trees will then also be low? The trick is to merge trees with the same degree until all trees have a different degree. So we allow at most one root with no children, one root with one child, and so on, up to the maximum degree. This ensures that including degree 0, the number of trees after cleaning up, is at most the maximum degree plus 1. We start by creating an intermediate array to keep track of root degrees. Again, we assume that we know the largest possible degree. So we create an array that contains one free spot for every possible degree. Then we iterate over the root list. Each tree is stored in one spot of the array, depending on the degree of its root. If we already have a tree with the same degree, we will merge both trees just like we saw before. Remember that this increases the degree of the root by 1. So we need to remove the tree from its spot in the array and move to the next one. Of course this spot might also be occupied, which requires us to do another merge. We'll keep merging trees until we eventually find a free spot. Then we continue iterating over the root list. How much work do we need to do in this phase? We need to initialize the temporary array so it's large enough to fit every possible node degree. Iterating over the root list takes time linear in the number of trees. We also need to consider the time for merging the trees. Each merge requires constant time. And every merge combines two trees, decreasing the number of trees by one. This means the number of merges is at most as large as the number of trees. So the time for merging disappears in big O notation. Now we can start rebuilding our heap. We iterate over the array and build up a new root list. It is during this phase that we also update the heap minimum. Because of the heap property, we only need to check tree roots. The total work for this phase depends on the size of the array, which again depends on the maximum node degree. So this is the total time we need for a single extract min. Remember, our amortized analysis showed that we can ignore the time spent for each tree and that only the work on top of that actually matters. It looks like that extra work depends on the maximum node degree. Because our cleanup ensures that no two roots have the same degree, we can be sure that the number of trees after the extract min is also at most the maximum degree. So it all relies on the maximum node degree. If we can somehow show that node degrees generally stay quite small, extract min will be fast. And this is exactly what we're going to do. Let's see how large some tree with a given degree can be. A tree with degree 0 of course contains just one node. Remember, we always merge trees that have the same degree. So let's merge two degree 0 trees to get a degree 1 tree. Merging two degree 1 trees gives us a degree 2 tree and so on. These kinds of trees have a special name. They're called binomial trees. Binomial trees have a few really cool properties. 
For example, children of binomial trees are just smaller binomial trees themselves. Which makes perfect sense if you think about how we just constructed them. What did we do during extract min? We removed the minimum and added its children to the root list. Then we started merging trees with the same degree. If all trees before the extract min were binomial trees, all trees after the extract min will also be binomial trees. Maybe take a minute to convince yourself that this is true. Because we start off with a bunch of single nodes, this means that at any time, all trees and all subtrees in our Fibonacci heap will actually just be binomial trees. So what is the largest possible node degree? Maybe you've noticed already that binomial trees grow exponentially, as every tree contains twice as many nodes as the previous one. This means that every tree with degree d contains exactly 2 to the d nodes. Or in other words, every tree with k nodes has degree log of k. What does this tell us about the maximum node degree? Let's say the entire heap contains 10 nodes. Then the largest possible degree is 3, because a degree 4 tree would already contain more nodes than the entire heap. The maximum node degree is therefore log of n if n is the total number of values in the heap. Let's recap what we've done so far. We started off with a binary heap. We realized that in theory we could implement insert and decrease key in constant time by being lazy. So we built a new kind of data structure where we implemented insert in the laziest way possible. Implementing extract min needed a lot more effort. But we realized that by using the power of amortization, we could implement it only needing time linear in the maximum node degree. And we've just shown that the maximum node degree is log of n for a Fibonacci heap containing n elements. So we indeed managed to improve the insert running time while keeping extract min the same. Now the only thing left is decrease key. Let's say we want to decrease the value 62. There are actually two possibilities. If the new value is still at least as big as its parent, we don't violate the heap property, so we don't need to do anything. But if the value is now smaller than its parent, we need to fix the heap property somehow. Of course, we could use the same bubble up approach we used with binary heaps. This would actually work, taking at most logarithmic time. But remember, we want to be lazy. Can you think of an even simpler thing we could do instead? Well, we could just cut out the node and insert it into the root list. Root values can be arbitrarily low, so this does fix the heap property, and we can do it easily in constant time. We just need to remember to check if we have a new minimum. Now, every decrease key call might add one more tree to the root list, which the next extract min needs to clean up. But this is basically just like insert, which means we can use the same amortization trick as before. You again can think of every decrease key call paying in advance for the additional but constant work during the next extract min. So we did it, right? We implemented decrease key in constant time. Actually, there is a pretty big problem with our implementation. Can you see it? Well, the running time of extract min relies on node degrees only growing logarithmically. But they only grow logarithmically because all trees are binomial trees. If we allow decrease key to arbitrarily cut out nodes, then our trees are not binomial trees any longer. This is a big problem. Look at this heap. The tree has degree 4 and therefore contains 16 nodes. But let's say we cut out all these nodes. We can do this by decreasing all keys down to 0. After that we can even remove them from the heap using extract min. Now the tree still has degree 4, but it only contains 5 nodes. While without decrease key, the tree with degree d always contained exactly 2 to the d nodes, now it could be as few as d plus 1. This means that the maximum node degree does not grow logarithmically anymore, but linearly, which of course completely destroys our extract min running time. So we are in somewhat of a dilemma. If we don't cut out nodes, decrease key will not be as fast as it could be. But if we do, there is a risk our node degrees grow too large, which slows down extract min. However, in practice, things don't actually look too bad. Situations like in the previous example, where a tree loses a lot of nodes, are probably quite unlikely. If we only cut out a few nodes here and there, our trees will still at least somewhat resemble binomial trees, and node degrees will remain low. But how can we be sure? This is where perhaps the most ingenious idea of Fibonacci heaps comes in. A compromise. We only allow cutting out one child per node. Intuitively, this ensures we don't stray away too far from the original tree shapes, 
while still having enough flexibility to cut out nodes. Let's see how this looks like. Say we decrease this node's key to 19, which means we need to cut it out, just as before. We mark its parent 22 to indicate that it has lost one child. But what happens when we also cut out this node? We know that 22 has lost two children now, because it's marked already. In this case, we cut out 22 as well. At first, this does not seem to make any sense. Shouldn't we cut out fewer nodes, not more? But think of it like this. We don't want trees with a large degree to contain few nodes. This tree with degree 4 starts to contain fewer nodes than it's supposed to. By cutting out 22 as well, we turn it into a degree 3 tree. This means it can now contain fewer nodes without posing a problem. Basically, cutting out children is fine, as long as we don't lose too many grandchildren. And cutting out nodes that have lost one child achieves exactly that. Once a node has been cut out, it doesn't pose a problem to its previous parent, so we can safely remove its marking. Notice that cutting out the parent node is recursive. This means there are situations like this one, where decreasing one key causes a bunch of nodes to be cut out. Believe it or not, this is how we can implement decrease key in constant time while extract min remains fast. But maybe you're not convinced yet. Which makes sense, because there are a few things about this approach I haven't addressed. We sometimes cut out more than one node during a single decrease key. So how is it possible we still only need constant time for a decrease key? And if we cut out more nodes, which we need to clean up later, how can extract min still be fast? And how can we be sure that node degrees only grow logarithmically? I've only made a few vague claims so far about not straying away too much from binomial trees. These are the questions I want to answer in the final section of this video. And yes, this is also the part where the Fibonacci numbers come in. We will start by dealing with the first question. Let's say we perform 10 decrease keys. What is the maximum number of nodes we need to cut out in total? Here are a few things to help answer this question. When we cut out a node, it's either because we decreased its key, or because it's marked. During each decrease key call, we mark at most one node. And once we cut out a marked node, we remove its marking. In the worst case, we need to cut out every node whose key we decreased. On top of that, we mark up to 10 nodes, which means we might need to cut out up to 10 additional nodes. So we need to cut out at most 20 nodes in total. In general, for k decrease keys, we need to cut out at most 2k nodes. What we just did is basically another amortized analysis. While a single decrease key might be slow, if we consider all decrease keys at once, on average, every decrease key cuts out at most two nodes and therefore only takes constant time. This insight allows us to answer the second question as well. Every insert call added one tree to the root list. So we thought of every insert paying in advance for cleaning up this extra node during the next extract min. We now know that every decrease key call on average cuts out at most two nodes, and therefore adds two trees to the root list. So every decrease key needs to pay for cleaning up two nodes. Sure, this is some extra work per decrease key, but it's only a constant amount of work. So decrease key's running time stays constant. Just like before, accounting for amortization the running time of extract min only depends on the maximum node degree. And this brings us to question 3. We need to somehow show that with our decrease key implementation, node degrees only grow logarithmically. If we can do that, extract min will take logarithmic time. Let's recall how we previously showed that node degrees grow logarithmically. We managed to show that every tree with degree d contain exactly 2 to the d nodes. So trees grow exponentially with their degrees. This implied that the maximum degree can only grow logarithmically in the size of the heap, because any tree with a larger degree would already contain more values than the entire heap. So the actual question is, do trees grow exponentially? With decrease key, things are a bit more complicated, because our trees don't have a fixed shape anymore. What we need to do is to look at the smallest tree for any given degree and show that even that worst possible tree contains at least exponentially many nodes. With exponentially, I don't necessarily mean 2 to the n. Actually, any base larger than 1 would be fine. This is because in big O notation, all logarithms behave the same, no matter their base. Let's look at this tree. We will call it x. 
The size of x depends on the degrees of its children y1 to y5. Higher degrees would mean more grandchildren, great-grandchildren and so on, and therefore a larger tree. With our initial degree key implementation, every child could have degree 0. But now things are different. Recall then when merging trees, we always added the new child at the right. This means that y1 is actually the oldest child of x, while y5 became a child of x most recently. Focus on y4. What is the smallest degree it could possibly have? At the time y4 became a child of x, x had at least three children, namely y1, y2 and y3. Maybe it had even more, which were cut out later, but it had at least these three. Remember, we always merge nodes with the same degree. So when y4 became a child of x, it too had at least three children. What could have happened to y4 since then? This is where our cut out at most one child rule comes in. Since then, y4 could have lost at most one child. Because if it had lost more than one, we would have cut it out and it wouldn't be a child of x anymore. This means that y4 must have at least two children. Or in general, yi, the ith child of some node, has at least degree i minus two. I know this was a lot to grasp, so feel free to rewatch this part if you didn't get it right away. Now we can actually construct the smallest possible tree with a certain degree. Degrees 0 and 1 are straightforward, because there is an obvious smallest tree. Starting from degree 2, we can use our new knowledge about child degrees. For example, the fourth child of the smallest degree 4 tree must have at least degree 2. To make it as small as possible, we will pick the smallest possible degree 2 tree. And we already know how it looks like. Do these numbers look familiar? These are the Fibonacci numbers, the famous sequence that starts with 0 and 1, where every falling number is the sum of the previous two. The only difference is that our tree sizes start two terms into the sequence. But why do the Fibonacci numbers suddenly show up? Let's look at the rightmost tree. Its first four children look just like the previous tree, and its fifth child looks just like the tree before that. Or in other words, its size 13 is the sum of the sizes of the previous two trees. So it really shouldn't be that surprising that the tree sizes are just the Fibonacci numbers. But how does this help us answer our question? Probably the most well-known fact about the Fibonacci sequence is that the ratio of two adjacent values in the sequence approaches this number, better known as the golden ratio phi. If you want to know why, I can recommend this video from Numberphile. But this means that every Fibonacci number is about 5 times as large as the previous one. And this is just exponential growth. And if the Fibonacci numbers grow exponentially, and the sizes of the smallest possible trees are just the Fibonacci numbers offset by 2, this means that the tree sizes must also grow at least exponentially. In fact, you can show that any tree with degree d must contain at least phi to the d nodes using a simple proof by induction. So the answer to our final question is a definite yes. And there we have it. It may have been a long and perhaps a bit convoluted process, but with the final operation decrease key, we are finally done. We managed to create a priority queue where every operation, except extract min, only takes constant time. And it turns out that even extract min is basically optimal, because of the so-called lower bound for comparison based sorting. But this is a topic for another video. If Fibonacci heaps are so good, they're probably used quite a lot in practice, right? Well, not really. In theory, Fibonacci heaps do improve the running times of certain algorithms compared to binary heaps. But in practice, the inputs to these algorithms must be huge before using such a complicated data structure like Fibonacci heaps is actually worth it. But if Fibonacci heaps aren't actually that useful, was all we did in this video for nothing? I don't think so. First, mathematicians think about things that have no practical purpose all the time. So why can't we do the same in computer science? And second, while many concepts in math or computer science are presented as these ingenious, beautiful ideas, Fibonacci show that more often than not, solutions to specific problems are messy and require many iterations to get just right.